Well, here's what we're going to do in this session. We're just going to talk about raising children. And uh, one of the great privileges in being married is having a family and raising our children well. And I'll just tell you a few things right up front. Uh, there's no such thing as an expert on raising children. And so if you think in this session, oh my goodness, let's learn from the experts. Well, you're in the wrong session. Uh, but what we do believe is that the Bible is clear and all of us can learn truths from the Bible to help us to have godly families. I'm not going to turn to Deuteronomy, uh, but I'll refer to it. If you want to turn in a Bible, we're going to look at a verse in Proverbs. Proverbs 22.6 uh, is a verse we'll look at in some detail and then we will apply some truths from that verse. But do you remember in Deuteronomy 6, are you all familiar with Deuteronomy 6? It's a family chapter. So every dad and every mom should frequently read Deuteronomy 6 because he lays out there that what we're to do is to know God's commands and God's laws so that we can apply them to our children. Okay, what did I say? Did I say it right? Okay, so we're good. All right, so we have to apply God's laws and God's word to our children. And here's what the Bible teaches us. Now learn this, okay? This is super important. What the Bible teaches is all of us are responsible for ourselves, for our children, for our grandchildren. Here's how he says it in Deuteronomy chapter 6. He said, I want you to know my words and I want you to, to, to take my words and apply them, you and your sons and your sons' sons. So we would say, we would say it differently than, than the King James Bible says it. We would say you, your children, and your grandchildren. So that God wants every one of you, all these babies around here, uh, God wants all of us to be training those little ones so that someday they will be adults who are well spiritually and who are well relationally and well emotionally. And you young parents, uh, one of the blessings of being a young parent is you got about 18 or 19 years or 20 years to do the job. So sometimes people are like, oh my goodness, my three-year-old is driving me crazy. Well, hang in there because you have 16 more years. Isn't that encouraging? And so it's a time thing. And so here's what the Bible says in Deuteronomy 22.6. Y'all have that? It's on, the, it's on the page there, actually, on page 13. Uh, uh, Proverbs, I said Deuteronomy, Proverbs 22.6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. It's the idea of the Word of God there is that this is our responsibility. Now, are you taking notes? So by introduction, introduction, several things you need to realize. First of all, let's think together. Nobody here but us. Consider to whom this verse is written. To whom? consider to whom this verse is written. Now, y'all thinking? We just had lunch, so we got to get our blood flowing a little bit because our brains may be a little slow. But, but here's what the Bible says. Train up a child in the way he should go. Who is that written to? Parents. To parents, not just parents though. A specific parent. Train up a child in the way he should go. So which parent is he writing to? Christian parents, yes, but he has it here. Parents of young children. Basically, if you're raising children, this is your verse. So we have a teenager, this is our verse because we have to train up our child in the way he should go. Uh, you guys have four, 13, 11, 13, 11, 8, 4. This is their verse. Train up a 13-year-old, an 8-year-old, 11-year-old, and a 4-year-old. I got that out of order, didn't I? 13, 11, 8, 4. Uh, train them up. So here's, uh, you know, several babies in the room. What the Bible is saying to you, train up your child in the way he should go. So you have from now until they are grown out of your house to accomplish God's plan. And so Beth and I have raised three that we're completely done with. Uh, Abby's no longer ours to, re to raise. She's 20, Abby is 28, so we're done. She's now David's responsibility. That's her husband. Uh, Joshua is 27 this summer. We're done. We're done raising him. Uh, Matthew's 24. See, we're done. Our, our, our Jake is 21 and still lives at home. So he drives my car. Uh, you know, he eats at my table, sleeps in my bed. 
So there's a sense. He's not, he's not 11. You know there's a difference in 11 and 21, right? But he's still our responsibility at, at this time. And then our charity, who's somewhere on the property, hopefully behaving, um, our charity is 15. She's our responsibility. See, we're still raising. So this is to whom it's written. You, you, does that make sense? Okay. The second line there, consider to whom it is not written. Now this crowd, we probably don't need to say this, but it is not written to parents who are done. Sometimes in your church, let me help you, you younger couples. Sometimes in the church, you will have an older couple who will be negative about raising children. We have had older couples say to us, well, good luck. We raised ours well, and they're not serving the Lord. Well, don't let that discourage you because this verse is not about that. If your kids, you know, are grown and not serving the Lord, this verse is still true for parents who are raising children. Does that make sense to you? Okay, and then number three, consider what it says. Okay, and, and this is where Beth and I'll jump in. Grab your microphone there, and uh, you can give us the fill in the blanks, all right? Okay. So here's the first word in the Proverbs 22, 6, all right? Give us that word and talk about it. The word is train. The most important word in Proverbs 22, 6 is to train your children. Children are not born trained. You have to train them to do all kinds of things. Practically speaking, you have to train them how to eat. You have to train them how to dress themselves. You will have to train them how to um, go to the bathroom by themselves. You have to train children to do all kinds of things. And if you want to train them in the things of the Lord, then you have to train them in that too. So it's not just the practical things, but the word train means many things. Do you want me to talk about that? Sure, or do you want ahead. to talk about it? Get us started. Okay, so the word train has many different definitions in the Hebrew. It means to dedicate. How many of you, um, I don't know, in the Slavic church, do you have a baby dedication service where you pray over the baby and over the parents? Yes, okay. So you dedicate your children to the Lord, but this is even beyond that. It's not just, well, we had a ceremony at church and we prayed over our baby, but you as the parent have totally dedicated yourself and your child to the Lord. So it's to dedicate, it is to set aside. Your children are being raised in a Christian home, so they are set aside from the world. They're not better than the people of the world, but they're different. So they're set aside. It means to hedge them. It means to aim them and to fence them in. David has some great illustrations of this, so if you sure. wanna jump in there. Are you guys familiar with the bow and arrow? Psalm 127 says in verse four that children are, are like arrows in the hands of a mighty man. So daddies and moms, God has given you children and think of the arrow, you have the bow. And what parenting is, is parenting is aiming our children to adulthood. So it's not, a, you know, when you're hunting, it's a one-time thing. You pull, you release, the arrow is done. God gives you 18, 19, or 20 years with your children to aim them in the right direction. Over and over and over again, you're aiming them in the right direction. We had lunch with our friends here today, and they were talking about how they're both musicians, and their children are now musicians. They're training them in music. So 18 or 19 years, this family is training in music. So what are they doing for 18 or 19 years? They're pointing their children to music. They're putting them in there and they're pointing them to music over and over. How many times? How many lessons? How much money? How much time? How much money? How many lessons? How many times do you have to say, go practice, go practice? Go. That's a wrong note. Correct the note. Don't do it that way. Do it the right way. No, no. We get ready. We're going to practice. Got to take the note. We're going to practice. We're going to over and over again. And that's how we do everything in with our children. Over and over again, we're aiming them in the right direction because the point is that someday you release them. Our job as parents is to prepare our children to go. Are you okay with that? So we were talking about this today at lunch too, because she was saying, ah, that's gonna be hard on me if my kids go. Well, yes it is, because you miss your children, but at the same time, there's positives to that. When charity is gone, it's just gonna be us. <laughs> Woo! Just us again, just like when we were first married. We're happy with our children, but our goal is to get them gone so we can be a couple again, just the two of us. 
And that's God's plan. That's a good thing. And then you're repeating yourself. If you aim your children in the right way, then they get married, they have children, they aim your grandchildren in the right way. They get married, have children, they aim your great-grandchildren in the right way. They get married, have children, they aim your great, great, how many greats have I got in there? <laughs> to great, great, great grandchildren in the right way. That's God's plan for your family. It means to aim. It also means to fence. Uh, that's a beautiful image for me because I was raised on a farm and in farming, you fence in the animal. It's the word train. So that your children, how many of y'all know this? Your children are sinners. How many of y'all know that? Do y'all know that? Yes. Let me try that again because y'all didn't respond. How many of y'all know that your children are sinners? Do you know that? They are sinners. They do wrong. So you fence them in because this is what we can do. This is what we can't do. This is what we can say. This is what we can't say. And we fence them in. And when we would have a steer... Uh, on our property and we would sell the steer, the farmer would come to get, you know, he just bought the cow. So he's going to come get the cow. So we would drive the cow into a corral. And so now he's in this little round corral and the farmer backs his truck up to the, to the corral, to what we call the loading chute. And we put the steer in the loading chute. The steer does not want to go in the back of the truck. Doesn't want to do that. Scares him. It's not going. So what he does is, is he refuses. That's what he does. So he, he's not going. So my dad is behind the steer because he wants him in the truck. The steer's going to try to back up, but to back up is painful because my dad would have a goad back there. It's an object with a sharp point on it, and he would stick the cow in the back of the leg. That's painful. Don't want to go back. Don't want to go forward. Don't want to go back. Someone will try to go to the right. So the cow would hit the fence, boom. He's trying to go to the, can't go to the right, boom. So he tried to go to the left, boom, he can't go. Why? Because he's fenced in. Moms and dads, what the Bible is saying here is we're training. We have to dedicate our children. We have to aim our children and we have to fence them in. That's why you have rules for your children. You may not do that. You may not do that. You have to do this. You have to do this because you're fencing in your children you're training them. You got the word train so far? All right, any question about the word train? Got the question, you got the, got the word? Okay, what's the second word? All right. A child. Ooh, this is a good one. Notice this, train up whom? A child. A child. How many of y'all have more than one? So he's not saying train children. He's saying train a child. So that every one of your children are unique. Y'all know that? Beth and I have five, and our five, all of our five are very different. Abigail is not Joshua. Joshua is not Matthew. Matthew is not Jake. Jake is not Charity. So you have to train them individually. What does it even look like? <laughs> well, obviously, your girls are going to be different from your boys. And it's sad to say, but in our culture, you need to recognize that. Bible, the Bible teaches us that God created man and woman. And parents are being encouraged these days to allow your children to just be whatever they want to be. But we as Christian parents know that God created them man and woman, boy or girl, that's just what they are. And so train them to be that way. Train your boys to become men and train your ladies to be feminine. So beyond that, they're just different in their personalities. Our oldest two were 14 months apart very close they're still very close friends but they are as different as daylight and dark we were just talking with our friends at lunch how that their oldest is the one in charge when they leave and she's in charge at home she's she's a leader she gets everybody in line well that's how our abigail was too and if you ask any of her siblings they would say oh my goodness she was so bossy when you would leave she would just boss us around and she wouldn't let us have snacks and she made us eat our vegetables well she was being a little mom that's how she was and even to this day abigail is an assistant to the director of facilities of a large ministry in Lancaster, or Lancaster, California, and she can get the job done. That girl can get the job done. But when she was a little girl, she had trouble with the truth. She would lie and she would lie and she would lie. She now, was dishonest all the time. We had to train her 
that the Bible teaches that lying is a sin and you may not lie. The Bible teaches that we need to be honest. Now her brother Joshua, on the other hand, is impeccably honest. Even to this day, if it's in here and it's the truth in his thinking, it's going to come out here. He's an assistant pastor at Horizon Baptist Church in Camarillo, California. And just a couple years ago, his pastor, the lead pastor, had him read a book about how to be kind in your communications with other people because he was so brutally honest sometimes. He just is an honest kid. But at the same time, when he was a little guy, he could be on the lazy side. You know, his sister's industrious, so let her do the job. I'll just sit here and watch her do the job. That's what he would do. And so we had to train Joshua to become industrious. And he is, he's a very hard worker. And our Abigail is a very honest girl. Sure. The way to think of it is like this, with your children, God designed each of your children uniquely with their spiritual gifts and their personality. Your job as a parent is to train that so that your children serve God with their unique gifts. However, each of your children also have sin cursed weaknesses. Do you understand that idea? So they have a strength, but they live in a sin cursed world. You have to strengthen their God-given gifts, but you have to correct their sin-cursed weaknesses. And if you fail in that, then you will have one child, think about this, you'll have one child that'll do really well and one that won't. If you, if you strengthen one child and correct that child, but the next one you let it go, you'll have one child that'll do well you'll have one child that won't. It's very common in Christian families for, say, a family of six, they have five that serve the Lord and one that doesn't. Well, there can be many reasons for that. Our children do have a sin nature. They can grow up and make wrong choices. Um, they can have influences that pull them away from God. Lots of reasons. But moms and dads, one of the reasons that you don't want it to be is because you failed to correct their sin-cursed weaknesses. So with our Abigail, she was dishonest. We had to correct that. We worked hard to correct that weakness in her life. Joshua was lazy. He just didn't care. But we worked hard to overcome that. And God enabled us in both of those situations. Our son Matthew was a very strong-willed child. You all know that term? very strong will. He's just like his mother. Just, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> he, he got a healthy dose of dad and mom and the in-laws and the outlaws and everybody. It's my son, Matthew. My goodness, he's a mess. And, but we had to correct that. He had a terrible temper, just would lose his temper. But what we had to do was we had 20, 17, 18, 19, 20 years to correct that. And we can't let it go because that's a weak weakness. That's going to damage him. We have to correct that. That's the idea of train up a child. You got the first two ideas? Okay, go ahead. I was just going to add that usually as parents, if we fail in this area, it's because we excuse a weakness in our child that we know we have in ourselves. So we will see, oh, she's just like me. I turned out okay, it'll be all right. And you don't wanna draw attention to that because it brings conviction to our own heart, doesn't it? Or we will praise a child for having a strength that we have, and we think that a strength that another child has, we think that's no big deal. Oh, oh well, good, good for you. You're not as strong as mom in this area, and we don't praise that in our child. So usually we tend to project on our children what we, have our own strengths and our own weaknesses and we need to ask the Lord for wisdom to train and strengthen the strengths and also correct the weaknesses. Isn't it amazing that God entrusts his children to you? They're his children, but he entrusts them to me and you to raise them. And if your child lives to be 60 years old, you get the first one third of their life. Think about that. If your child lives to be 80, God gives you the first one-fourth of their life. And if your child lives to be 100, God lets you have the first one-fifth of their life. 
you're the foundation for the rest of their life. That's why this is so important, moms and dads. Train up a child, here's the next phrase, in the way he should go. It's verse number three. Start to say verse three. It's not a verse, it's a point. Number three in your notes, in the way he should go. You know what that word means? That phrase, it means in his mouth. Literally in the Hebrew Bible, it says, train up a child in his mouth. Now, how many of y'all agree that's a weird thing to say? We don't say that. What does that mean to train up a child in his mouth? It means three things, okay? Number one, it's the beginning. When we use the word mouth, it's the beginning of something. The mouth of, the mouth of is often the beginning of something. It also can be the ending of something. The mouth of the mighty Mississippi River is where it ends at the Gulf of Mexico. So if you're coming out of the Gulf of Mexico and you're going to sail up the Mississippi River, you enter the mouth of the mighty Mississippi at its end. It's, that's where it ends. Starts in Minnesota, winds up down in the Gulf of Mexico. Up here's the mouth, the beginning. Down here's the mouth, the ending. This is the Hebrew word. It also has the idea of appetite. Now, you know, don't you, moms and dads, that, that the lesson here is you start at the beginning. How old is your little one? You start now training, right? You say, yeah, but they're just six months. But six months olds are in the process of being trained. When you're trying to change a diaper and the little one is fussing, I don't want my diaper change and arching his back, and you say, no, sir. You change your voice. What are you doing? Right here in the beginning, you're, tra you're, you're training. When ours were little, there were times when they had to get a little bit of attention, a little sharp tap on the leg or a little, a little spank on the leg, just a little bit. And all of a sudden your child is like, why did you do that to me? Because you're not behaving right. We're, we're correcting your behavior. So you're training from the beginning. What's the goal of parenting? Did you know that the goal of parenting is the end? Our goal is to get them, we're, our goal is to be done. Our goal is that our children will someday be 18 and they will know the Lord and love the Lord and fear the Lord and be hard workers and be ready to serve God. You've got 20, 18 or 20 years to get them there. That's the mouth. It's also the appetite. Uh, forgive me, you guys are sitting in front of me and we just talked. But here's a couple that one of the things that will probably be true in their children's life is they will have an appetite for music because we were sitting at the table listening to them talk about all the hours and the money and the time they've invested in training their children to do music. Now, people were homeschoolers, so in the homeschool world, people were like, what do your children play? And I used to joke and say, well, our kids play Legos. Okay, now, that was, that was just our joke because we didn't do as much music. We sang, our family sang, we had a CD we recorded and all that kind of stuff, but, but but that wasn't necessarily the main priority for us. For their family, one of the things they will be known for is music. So they're giving their children an appetite for music. That's a, that's a blessing and a danger, okay? The blessing is, moms and dads, give your, appetite, your children an appetite for things that matter. Like, teach them to work hard. That matters, they will have to work the rest of their life. Teach them to have an appetite for God and His Word and for church and for worship. Those things are important. Be on guard or you can give your children an appetite for things that don't matter. If you're not careful, you can give your children an appetite for sports. It's not wrong to play ball, but if our children only have an appetite for sports and they're not in love with God or don't know God's word, then we failed as parents. If we train our children to only have an appetite for money, they have an appetite to make money, make money, make money, and money is so important that their marriage suffers or they don't even go to church anymore because they work even on Sundays. They're always working, working, working. We train our children to have wrong appetites, then we fail as parents. So what are you training? Think about these questions. How well are you training your child individually? Do you know their strengths? Do you know their weaknesses? Are you strengthening their God-given strengths and correcting their God-given weaknesses? And think about this, um, are you training their appetites well? 
Where, where do you want them to be? In, in our culture here in the USA, in our culture, we are anti-marriage now in the culture. And if we're not careful, we can be in the church. Did y'all know that? Because in the church, in many of the places where we preach, our boys are not learning how to work. That's going to hurt their marriage because men have to provide for a family. Girls are no longer being taught how to cook. Nobody's training them. So they're not being prepared to take care of a family. See, this is practical, spiritual. It's the whole package. Train up a child in the way he should go. Anything you'd add to the idea there? And then there's one more thing there, number four. Give us that one. Train so that when the child is older, he will be going the right way. Or you could put the word adult in there if you want. Train so that when the child is an adult, he will be going the right way. Two things you've got as a parent. Number one, you've got to train their appetites so they're prepared for, do you all use this term? Adulting. That's the new term so they can adult well. Because our goal is that our kids grow up to adult well. Does that make sense? And then, then uh, think through the verse, train up a child in the way he should go so that when he is older, he'll be going that way, is the idea. Now here's the question, does it work? Does this work? Are you saying, that we can take 18 years and train our child so that they go in the right way as adults. Does that work? That's a question. Did you know there's a lot of people who believe it doesn't work? We meet people in our conferences who don't believe that. They believe that, well, you know what? Try, but who knows? We don't believe that. We believe, moms and dads, you can train all of these little boys and girls and your kids that are back home and your teenagers, we believe you can train them and it works. I, I go to the Philippines. Have you ever been to the Philippines? I love the Philippines. And when I go to the Philippines, I have a college in the Philippines that I help with and I preach meetings in the Philippines and have pastors conferences. My Filipino brothers and sisters, when I'm in the Philippines, they say to me, they say, now, uh, Brother Young, we want you to be an honorary Filipino. That's what they tell me. We want you to be an honorary Filipino. If you're going to be, you have to eat, this is what they tell me, you have to eat balut. Anybody ever heard of balut? Balut is a goose egg duck. Balut is a duck egg with the baby inside it. They take the duck egg with the little baby still in the egg and pastor, they boil that and serve it as a meal. And you, here's how you eat it. You buy the little duck egg, it's, it's called balut, and you crack it and you peel the top off and you drink the fluid. And then you peel the egg and you can see the baby, chick, the baby duck in there. It's like, you know, it's thin, you know, cartilage like your ear. It's, it's fl flimsy, but it's still a duck. You can see it. It looks like a duck. And they boiled it, and now you eat it. You bite in there, and you chew up the little beak and the little eyes and the little feet, and you eat the little... Now, let me ask you a question. Does that sound disgusting to you? Okay, let me ask you a question. Why does an entire nation of young people in the Philippines love it? There's an entire nation that eats balut. Why? I'm going to tell you the answer because they were trained. That's the whole answer. I went to, I went to uh, Moldova many, many times through the years to preach. And when I'm in Moldova, the first time I was in Moldova, they said, uh, you're gonna love today because today is, bor how do you say it? Borscht day. <laughs> today we're having borscht. Is that how y'all say it? Borscht for dinner. We're gonna have, we're gonna have borscht for dinner. And, and then I did. And I was like, I don't know if I love this or not. But I kept going back, and I went back, and I went back, and since that's what they served and you had to eat, you know, I decided I could like this. I trained my taste that I can eat it. Now, I don't know. I've never come home and said, Bethley, would you make that for me? But I don't mind it. I eat it. And, and see, here's the deal. As far as I know, if you're not Russian and you weren't raised in a Slavic culture, Probably you don't just go like, hey, let's make Russian borscht for dinner. 
But if you're trained, you eat it, right? You eat it. One of the things I've noticed, I don't know that I've ever been to a conference where you have breakfast and then they put food out and say, come get a snack. And then you have dinner at lunch and they're like, hey, there's food over there. Get something to eat. And then you have supper and they're like, hey, there's food over there. Get something to eat. I love this place. I love it. But see, we weren't trained that way, but you guys were. So you're trained. Our weddings aren't like your all's weddings. I understand at weddings you gain weight. Right? When you guys go to weddings, you put weight on because you eat and you eat a lot and you keep eating all night long because weddings are food. Right? See, it's training. And here's the point, guys, ladies and gentlemen. If you and I can train our children to eat boars or balut, if we can train our children in things that, can I say this, don't really matter, can you see what God is saying to us? We have to train our children in areas that really matter. So we got a few moments here and a few fill in the blanks uh, because all of us ought to be training our children. So how do you do it? Number one, train them to be obedient. Train them to be obedient. When on this one, what's Ephesians 6, 1 say? Children, do y'all know this verse? Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. That's where parenting starts. Train your children to obey. That's where it starts. You've got to master this one. Train your children to obey. That is vitally important. Uh, it's, a, it's a verse we taught our children. When they were little, we would have devotions at night with our babies. So we would uh, get them dressed for bed. Bethley would nurse the baby change the baby, we'd wrap the baby up, we're gonna put the baby down for the evening, we would quote this verse, children obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. We said it every night till they could say it out loud. This is where parenting starts, obey your parents and the Lord. My daughter Abigail, she quoted it like this, she would say, children obey your parents in the Lord for they are right. But that's not what it says, she misquoted it. My son Matthew, my mother said to my son Matthew one day, she said, quote me a memory verse. And he said to my mother, children, obey your parents in the Lord for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. <laughs> well, that's not wrong, but that's not what the verse says. Parents, you've got to be really good at training uh, in obedience. And so fill in the blanks here real quick and then we'll talk about it. Number one, obedience is the first the first lesson a child should learn. It's the first. B, obedience is a matter of doing what you are told. Doing what you are told. C, obedience teaches self-control and self-denial. It teaches our child to limit themselves. D, obedience produces happy children. Obedient children are happy children, all right? And then let's see here where we are. Uh, obedience, um, uh, E, obedience requires rules and corrections. And letter F, disobedience produces blindness. Think of it in, 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 in this way. Right, do I need to repeat those or do y'all get those fill in the blanks? Anybody need those repeated? Okay, B, uh, obedience is a matter of doing, do, doing what you are told. And C is self-control. Obedience teaches self-control and self-denial. Now, moms and dads, Beth and I can talk to you about this. Here's what you do. Number one, you and your spouse decide what your expectation is. What do you expect from your children? Do you expect for them to to respond with a yes sir or yes ma'am, then you, you, you gotta know your expectation. When you speak, what do you want them to do? Know what you expect. Number two, communicate what you expect. A child can't obey if you're not teaching them what you expect. So if you got a teenager, make sure they know what you expect. When you say to a teenager, what do you want them to do? You have to communicate that. Know your expectations, communicate it, 
And then, here's what you do, you follow through. This is a hard one. Because a lot of times we have expectations, but we don't wanna take the time to follow through with the training, right? Because life is busy and children misbehave at the most inopportune times. And, and you gotta stop everything and deal with it. Moms and dads, make it a priority that every time I'm gonna follow through with what I expect. And then number four, you correct, okay? And this is important. So we, we, we need to zero in on this just a little bit. You correct your children. This is how you correct. You correct your children with your words. You say to your child, no, you're correcting. No, you may not do that. No, you're correcting with your words. When you say to your child, the Bible says lying is wrong. Your words, you're correcting your child. You use your words, the Bible says you're speaking. Number two, you use your words. Number two, you stop them. You speak to them, you stop them. These little ones, you're stronger. Stop the misbehavior. You're stronger. You're older, hopefully wiser. <laughs> you, you stop it. But number three, number three, you um, be gentle with this one. Sometimes you have to spank it. You speak, you stop, you spank. Now, this is a tr tricky one. The Bible word is the rod. How many of y'all know that word in the Bible? The idea is that, that we have to correct our child. Uh, the, the King James, our English Bibles, speaks about beating a child with a rod. And it's an uncomfortable word for us. But what the word means is conquering the child. The word beat has the idea of you're conquering the child. You don't want the child, you remember the Bible phrase, left to himself? You don't want to leave a child to himself because what will a child do that's left to himself? He will bring shame to you. He will damage you and himself or herself. So we have to conquer the child. What you do is you start while they're really young. Beth and I got together and we said, what do we want from our children? We decided, we communicated it, and we even determined what would be spanking matters. Because not everything is. Children spill stuff, right? Everybody does that. That's just an annoyance. But that's not a spanking matter. Uh, here, here's a phrase I've taught uh, a, a lot. Let me see if I can give it to you right. The idea of the rod in the Bible is to amplify the consequences of negative behavior before it's a big deal. Okay, I'm gonna say that again, okay? Think, think with me. The idea of training obedience and correcting a child with a rod is you're amplifying a consequence of a negative behavior before it's a big deal. Now I'm gonna illustrate, okay? Y'all ready? I want you to answer a question. Are y'all ready to answer a question? I want you to answer out loud, okay? Here's the question. You have a three-year-old and your three-year-old lies. Okay, now here's the question. You got the scenario? You have a three-year-old and your three-year-old lies. Here's my question, okay? Tricky. Is that a big deal? Okay, what's the answer? Okay, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna challenge you on that. Okay, no, it's not, they're three. Okay, it is a sin, can't argue with that. That's a big deal, right? But in the grand scheme of life, they're three. His wife's not leaving him, he's three. His, okay, that's true, but he's three. So here's God's plan, here's God's plan. God's plan is that you take care of lying while it's less of a big deal. See, if you can correct a three-year-old, a 33-year-old who lies at his work and gets fired, can I say it like this, is a bigger deal than a three-year-old lies about whether or not he ate the cookie. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Lying is both a sin, right? We all agree on that one. That's why you said yes, because lying is a sin and we are Baptists and we know that lying is wrong. Amen. Amen. Yes? Okay. But there are three. So God's plan is that Beth and I get together and we correct while they're really young. If you can speak to your child and correct them, praise God. 
Because some kids you can. Some kids you can be like, don't you ever lie again. Like, okay, I will never lie again. And it's over. If you got a kid like that, get on your knees and praise God. <laughs> I'm serious. Just praise God for that kid. Because most kids aren't that way. You speak to the kid. Okay, don't you lie again. And two hours later, they lie again. 24 hours later, they lie again. So you speak again. We don't lie. They keep lying. What do you do? You have to amplify the consequences. That's why in the Bible and in history we spank children. Because what we're trying to do is teach children that negative behavior leads to negative consequences. Do you see that? So here's how we did it. We live in a culture to where you can go to the doctor and the doctor says, do you spank your child? And that's a big deal. So we found a pediatrician that supported our parenting methods. We homeschooled so that we had more freedom to train our children without them being in a public school where they're getting questioned about whether or not mommy and daddy spanked them. See, what we're trying to do is raise children in our culture and raise them the Bible way. And then we had a method for spanking. We had an object that was flexible and it stung. It was flexible enough to sting. But, uh, it, let me say it again, it was firm enough to sting, but flexible enough that it didn't damage anything. We were trying to be wise about that. When I was a kid, when I was a kid, my dad believed in spankings, and my dad would take a limb off a tree and get you by the hand and just wear you out with it. Just, just spank you. You get marks on the back of your legs. I'm messing up your recording, aren't I? And, uh, and, and, and you gotta be careful about that. So what we did is we came up with a method and, and, and we found the, the, the rod we were going to use, flexible. And then what we would do, and, and I'm gonna illustrate this as best I can the way you're, you are. But what I would do is we would take the child, nobody's angry, I'm not yelling. Am I losing this? Oh, thank you. I'm not yelling, I'm not raising my voice. I've already determined what I'm going to do. We would say, come with me. And then we would go into a room and we would sit down. I would say, come here. I would stand my child between my legs. Beth and I often tried to do this together so that the child knows mommy and daddy are together on this. We would have our child, mom would hold the hands. If mommy is not there or daddy is not there, have them put their hands together like they're praying because they will be shortly <laughs> if you do this right. And mommy, hold the hands and you take this arm and you hold the child down. And you bring your legs together to protect the tender portions on the back of their leg. When you put this arm down and you bring your legs together, there's a portion left over. Do I need to explain that or can we move on? Y'all okay. got Okay, good, good. And you take the rod and you spank what's left over there. And here's how we did it. When we were kids, our parents would just, just, just let you have it. Boom, 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 boom. We don't live in that culture and we have to be wise raising our children. So what we would do is we would, we would say, uh, you're gonna get two swats, just two. And we would administer those two. We wanted it to sting, but not damage. So we administer two swats and we're gonna quote you the Bible verse, it's wrong to lie. And we're gonna pray with you and hug you and it's over. Hopefully that's the last time you have to do that. But if they don't correct it, you do it again. And if your child refuses to correct it, you do it more. You just follow God's will. You're amplifying consequences. Now, spanking's not the only way. Y'all know that, right? It is a Bible way. But there's other ways, like if you've got a teenager and your teenager's misbehaving, well, I don't know, do they like video games? Take their video game. Sorry, you can't go to camp. You can't play that ball game. You can't go to that friend's event. Make the consequence hurt, okay? Is this making sense or not? Yes. All right, anything you'd add to that? Because I just taught it all probably then. Are we, we good? Any question about that at all? You're training obedience, yes sir? Someone who actually believes that. 
Well, what I would say to them is, obviously, you've not read your Bible. What if it's a matter of interpretation, they say? Well, it, words have meanings, and that's the answer to that. Words have meanings. Interpretation can vary, but words have meanings. And the word rod and the word beat does have the idea of painful consequences. That's just the word. So, so the thing about it is, this is, this is how it also answer that. Words have meanings and what the Bible words. Secondly, experience has influence. If we believe in 2024 that spankings are unbiblical, that would mean that 5,000 years of human history got it wrong. Secondly, the results matter. And the question I would ask anybody about that, okay, we are a generation that does not believe in spankings. Compared to previous generations, how are we doing? There has never ever been a generation before this one where kids would go to school and shoot each other in cold blood. Never. We're the first generation. And so the point is that we have all these new parenting methods in the church even, and they're not working. And so you have to look at what do the words mean? You have to look at human history. How did our forefathers do it? And you have to look at the end result. And if something has worked for 2,500 years, and all of a sudden along comes a new TikTok influencer in Christianity who says, well, that won't work. This is a better way to do it. And yet they're raising a three-year-old. Like if I wanted to know how to raise children, uh, I would go to pastor whose kids are grown, right? Pastor, you're, you've got kids that are grown. If his grown kids are well, I'd go to him and say, what did y'all do? I'd go to pastor and say, what'd y'all do? Because your kids are grown. How'd y'all get them there? I wouldn't go to a TikTok influencer who has a five-year-old because at this point, the verdict is still out. So you go to the Bible and look at the words. They have meanings. You look at history because history, if, if, if 5,000 years of human history has translated that verse the same, it's kind of weird that all of a sudden we have discovered the meaning after all these 5,000 years, we now know a new meaning. The Hebrew word is always meant the same and then the experience matters. So that's how I would answer that. That is a very common thing. We have a method called gentle parenting today, and, and that's a huge issue for your all's generation. The problem with gentle parenting is it does not apply Bible principles. It applies psychological principles. And the problem with gentle parenting is there's no way to prove it because it's a new philosophy. So parents, if you have to choose between an old philosophy that has worked and a new philosophy that is not err on the side of the old. That's how I would answer that. Does that make sense? Yes, sir? Any distinctions that need to be made when it comes to physically disciplining either a boy or a girl? Not necessarily. There's some weird ideologies in our culture. Uh, we're just a generation that um, we have embraced so many uh, erroneous positions that things just get so weird and convoluted now. I would say just simplify things down. And the idea of it is, obviously girls and boys are different, but you correct both. And, and maybe, maybe you are more gentle with a, you know, a, a tender daughter than a stubborn son. On the other hand, you might need to be more gentle with a gentle son and a stubborn daughter. You know, you may need to, so each child will be individual there. Male and female uh, doesn't necessarily make a difference because the Bible doesn't separate them when it comes to correcting their behavior. I would just say that's a matter of wisdom and ask God for wisdom about that. You never want to treat them differently to the point where one grows up and turns out well and the other one is a, is a sorrow to your heart the rest of their life. That's the one thing you don't want to happen. So that's a really good question though. Was there another part to that or did I, did I is that good? Was there another question about this first point? Because we're about out of time here. Was there another question? Do you guys sell those ideal rocks? <laughs> no, I can tell you what it is. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. Kids would hate me all over the world. <laughs> I did speak on a uh, parenting at Pensacola a Christian College's campus church some years ago. It's been a long time ago now. And a few days later in the cafeteria, there was a group of teenagers sitting together in the cafeteria. And one of my friends heard them talking. And the one kid says, 
has your mom and dad been really hard on you since that guy taught the other night in church? And the other kid says, yes, they have. I hate Dave Young. <laughs> so I thought, well, that's different. But so, so use a lot of wisdom. Is there another question about training obedience? We really are out of time, but let me at least give you the notes, okay? Nothing I can at least give you the notes uh, on the next page. Uh, by the way, that bottom one there, disobedience produces blindness. You know what I base that on? There's a verse in Proverbs. I don't know how your Slavic Bibles would translate it, but the English translation is, is awesome. It says, let me see if I can get this right. Uh, the eye that refuses to obey its father, um, and the, it's about the, a young person who refuses to obey, the Bible says that the uh, young, the raven shall pluck out that eyeball and the eagle shall eat it. You ever read that verse? Look it up. A disobedient child, here's what the Bible says will happen to them. Ravens will pluck out their eyes and eagles will eat their eyes. Um, I knew you were going to ask me that and I didn't write it down, but it's probably in my notes. Is it in my notes? I don't even have my notes. I can't believe I don't do that. Look, Bethel will look it up here and tell me in a moment. Um, you can look at my Bible program here. I'll, I'll find it for you. But, but the idea of that verse, the idea of that verse is blindness. Obviously, you've never seen a raven pluck out an eyeball, right? Have you ever seen an eagle eating a rebellious kid's eyes? So obviously, that's not literal. It's a picture of blindness. And what happens when a person is blind? can't see. So they have no discernment, they have no direction, and they have no defense. Like uh, Nick, Nick, do you work out or do you just work hard? You do neither? Well, I mean, you're kind of like built, so. Proverbs 30, 17. 30, 17. There you go, 30, 17. All right. Okay. So you take somebody that's strong as a mule and, and, and bigger than me, if they're blind, I can beat them. Do you know that? Nick, come here. Let me just illustrate that. Come here, Nick. Come here, real quick. Hurry, hurry. See, Nick is bigger than me, right? Stand right here. Think I could take him? Yes. Well, probably not. That he's, guy's bigger than me, so... I don't know if I could take him or not. He's bigger than I am. But I can tell you what, if he's blind, I can take him. I'd get me a baseball bat. <laughs> I'd beat the daylights out of him, wouldn't I? Because he can't see me. And the Bible is teaching here, if we fail to train our children obedience... No, stay with me. If we fail to train our children in obedience, they're blinded. Like, close your eyes. Now go back to your seat. Do not open those eyes. I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, he could do that, couldn't he? But that'd be a lot harder. And the Bible's telling us here, moms and dads, we've got to train obedience. All right, now you can go back to your seat. Uh, train them in the gospel is the next line there. Train them in Christianity. That's the line. Train them in Christianity. Number two, train them in Christianity. Put that there on that line. Because you want to see your boys and girls saved and teach them the stories of the Bible. And you want to get them to come to Christ as early as possible. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth. You want to disciple them so they go to church with you and read the Bible with you. And guys, have family devotions with your children. You don't have to have a revival service but you need to read the Bible to your children and pray with your families. Letter three there, number three, train them to lead a, a successful life, successful life. Train them to lead a successful life. And I have three thoughts there. What are they? Give us the, give us the three, go ahead. It takes work, respect, and purity. So success in life, you're not just treating them to be obedient and to be Christians. You are training your children to succeed, and it looks like you guys are doing pretty good at that as far as you adults are hardworking people and you're working on your marriage. The Slavic culture seems to get that right, but don't allow American culture to cause you guys to fail in that area. You gotta train your kids to work. They can do dishes, they can do laundry, they can mow yards, they can work with you on the job. Train them, train them to have respect for authority. We all, we, we're not fans, forgive me if you are, but we're not fans of President Biden. We disagree with many of his policies, but we are also respectful. That's President Biden. So we show him respect. We pray for him in our family. We won't vote for him, but we pray for him. And if he's voted back into office, he'll be our president. We will show him respect. We disagree with him 
strongly on some areas. But he's our president. So we want our kids to show respect. And we want our kids to pursue purity. Have you guys noticed that you live in an impure world? So you've got to train your children to pursue purity all the days of their life. Um, any questions for my wife? I've done all the talking here at the end. Any question for her before we go? Ladies, any question you would have as a mom for my wife? Any, any, any other question at all? Yes, sir? By herself? You mean discipline by herself? Both, either or. Well, I, I think that's just a practical thing. The only reason we tried to do it together is so that our children knew that we were on the same page. Our children knew that it wasn't just mommy, it wasn't just daddy, no, we're the same. But our children also knew that if mommy wasn't there, daddy could spank you, and if daddy wasn't there and you needed it. See, we didn't spank for everything. In fact, we spanked rarely in some ways. Because our goal, we don't just spank for everything. We spank to train. It's a training matter. And if a child will not do what's right, then that child has to be corrected. And, and if you can talk and correct them, do it. If you can, can correct them, do it. But if the child is rebellious and stubborn and will not do what's right, then you have to, you have to spank. So Bethley would do it when I wasn't there. And even on one occasion, as you have a larger family, when daddy wasn't there and she needed help, one of the older siblings would hold the child's hands while mommy spanked the child. And our goal is to be done with spanking sooner than later. So by the time our kids are teenagers, we don't want to spank them. We want to train them in discipleship. The teen years are times to train them for adulthood and it's a discipleship time. So uh, here's one thing we've done for years that's really helped us. We read a book every year on marriage Every year we find a book on marriage and we try to read it together. We read a book on parenting. We're always reading books on parenting. They're not Bible, they're just helpful books. We use what we can, throw out what we can't. But we read, read, read. You live in a generation where there are 42,000 books on the family on Amazon alone. 42,000 books on Amazon about the family. Obviously, some of those aren't worth reading, but you can learn from anything. So get good books, ask pastor to recommend them to you. Daddies, you may not be a big reader, but you ought to read for the sake of your marriage and your family. Girls, you may not be a big reader, but read for the sake of your marriage and your family. It's helped us. Would you have any final thought to share with them before we're done? It's not one word. Come on, I know you do. Okay. <laughs> all right, David, thank you, sir. It's all yours. Thank you so much.